All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, as Jerry stated, my name is John Marcus. That's at least my colonized name. Um, my indigenous name is Yanachkri. Um, I'm an associate professor here in Latino, Latino studies and African American studies at Northwestern. We've been teaching courses in Native American studies here for a few years. Um, so it's good to see that there's a lot more energy being built around, around this topic, or at least this field of inquiry. Um, in the current moment, uh, Lauren uh, Gigioni and others have been organizing with the One Book One Northwestern project to kind of help highlight some of these some of these issues amongst our student body, provide spaces and opportunities, and so that's welcoming as well. Um, I'm also the um, the newly appointed Northwestern University liaison to the American Indian Studies Consortium at the Newberry Library, and this is how I got to know Patricia. Um, and so it's, it's, it's quite an honor. One of the things that we're trying to do by joining this consortium is provide a space and resources for students and faculty who are interested in helping to grow uh, Native American studies on this campus and to join a broader kind of consortium of, of, of institutions that, that kind of have a head start on this. So one of the weird things about being um, a member of the consortium and not having Native American studies is that I'm often speaking on behalf of something that doesn't exist when I'm at the consortium talking to colleagues from other campuses. Um, but nonetheless, it's been interesting the past couple of years you know, working there and trying to provide more of a visible presence for Northwestern and some of the things that we're increasingly interested in with regards to not just studying indigenous peoples, but using Native American studies as a particular type of critique, specifically of liberal reform and its discontents, its failures over time, and the often not considered issue of settler colonialism that doesn't really get programmed in our academic in a lot of our ethnic studies paradigms. Um, so I'm happy to talk with you and uh, with any of you uh, about the consortium, about our relationship to the, to the Newberry Library. I'm happy to be in conversation with you about the development of Native American studies, um, where it's been. Us as a faculty who have been involved in that conversation would not necessarily agree. Um, or have a consensus with regards to what Native American Studies is, has been, and should be. But nonetheless, the conversation has been vibrant, and I look forward to pushing it forward. Um, I'm also a citizen of the Chiricahua Apache Nation, um, of the Indebti Band of, of the Chiricahua Apache. So it's especially uh, an honor to be able to introduce um, Patricia today, who's also uh, a descendant of those peoples. So Patricia Marroquin Norby. Is a, is a Purepecha and Ende Apache descent. And she's also the director, as Jerry said earlier, of the Darcy McNichol Center for American Indian, Indigenous, and Indigenous Studies at the Newberry Library. She's a member of the Board of Trustees of the Field Museum and also serves on the Administrative Oversight Committee for the Chicago American Indian Community Collaborative, a 17 member organization that serves the needs of the Chicago American Indian Community. Dr. Marroquin Norby's professional background includes exhibition and curatorial research at the Smithsonian Institute's National Museum of the American Indians, inaugural exhibits, and a professorship in American Indian Studies at the University of Wisconsin. She has also worked as an academic and legal advocate for American Indian and Mexican migrant communities in Wisconsin. An award-winning scholar of American Indian art and visual culture, she earned her PhD in American Studies from the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, and a Master of Fine Arts degree from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Her writing centers on New Mexican artists, and her work, she utilizes her fine arts training to draw critical connections between fine art production, environmental politics, and the physical health of American Indian artists. So once again, it's an honor and a pleasure to introduce to you all to not only somebody who I've been working with um, over at the Newberry, but also my distant Apache cousin, uh, Patricia Marroquinor. Thank you, John. There's always this moment when someone's reading your bio and you're like, is that really me? <laughs> I always have that weird um, moment, but yeah. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. And I also want to say um, thank you to Jerry Cadava, Dr. Jerry Cadava, and also um, Nancy and the other members of the One with One team for this opportunity to speak with you, share with you today. I'm going to start out with um, a little bit of information, background information about the Newberry. 
So uh, the Newberry Library was founded in July of 1887 and opened in September of that year. The Chicago businessman, Walter L. Newberry, bequeathed $2.2 million in his will for uh, the foundation of a free public library on the north side of the Chicago River. Original locations of the Newberry include LaSalle Street, then Ontario Street, and then in 1893, the Newberry found its permanent home on the southwest corner of Clark and Walton. So what you're looking at is the front of the building. The front of the building is Walton, and then if you can see the upper, um, from where you're sitting, the upper left corner, that would be Clark Street. Today, the Newberry is recognized worldwide for its collection strengths in American history and culture, American Indian and Indigenous studies, Chicago and the Midwest, genealogy and local history, maps, travel, and exploration, medieval, renaissance, and early modern studies, music, and religion. Today, I'm going to, be, um, I'm going to address a few points. First is the uh, Newberry's Edward E. Eyre American Indian Collection, which is the prominent um, American Indian Indigenous collection at the Newberry. We also have smaller collections that are related to Eyre's um, archives. But I'll be talking about Eyre's um, collection in particular. Also, the responsibilities and challenges of working on a day-to-day -day basis with American Indian materials, which directly relates to, as, um, as John uh, pointed out, um, dealing with issues of historical trauma, decolonization, settler colonialism. This is something that we have to face on a daily basis working with these materials. I'll also talk briefly about the Darcy McNichol Center and how it started. Um, so it's the Darcy McNichol Center for American Indian and Indigenous Studies, and that name changed fairly recently. It was originally known as the Darcy McNichol Center for American Indian History, and then recently was changed to involve all indigenous peoples um, worldwide. And then I'll also talk about my own research. So the Edward Eyre American Indian Art, or American Indian Collection. Edward Eyre was um, a Wisconsin and Chicago lumberman and bibliophile and original trustee to the Newberry Library. He was born in 1841 in Kenosha, Wisconsin, to parents who had come to the Midwest in 1836 from New England. In 1855, the Eyre family settled in Harvard, Illinois, and at the age of 18, Eyre left for California, where he worked in lumbering until he enlisted in 1861 in the 1st California Cavalry. During his service with the California Cavalry and while marching in Arizona and New Mexico, Eyre interacted with Mexican Indian and American Indian communities, which led him to read Prescott's History of Mexico and started his long-term fascination and really an obsession with everything pertaining to indigenous peoples. Eyre grew his own uh, wealth, thriving in the railroad tie business, first supplying Chicago, the Chicago and Northwestern railroads and quickly expanding to include contracts across the country with the Union Pacific and other railroad companies. The young lumber baron collected matchless documentation of American Indian culture and history, European settlement, and interaction between American Indians and Europeans. Air collected in all formats, including printed books, maps, atlases, manuscripts, photographs, and artwork. By the end of the century, with the Spanish-American War, Eyre added the Philippines and Hawaii to his uh, collecting scope. He also hired transcribers to copy thousands of pages of original documents in Spanish and um, in Mexican archives. Eyre's formal gift of his collection to the Newberry occurred in 1911 and included 33,407 items. He actively added to his collection until his death in 1927, and then endowed his collection so that it can continue to grow. Today, the Air Collection is one of the world's most comprehensive archives of American Indian history, and consists of 130,000 volumes, 
1 million manuscript pages, 2,000 maps, 500 atlases, 11,000 photographs, 3,500 drawings and paintings, and over 4,000 items uh, directly related to indigenous language, languages at the hemispheric level. Comprised of 40 different sub-collections, um, and I work specifically with the Air Art Collection. So the Air Art Collection um, is one sub-collection that is internationally recognized for its strength in visual materials that represent American Indian history and culture, European and American Indian encounters, European settlement in the Americas, and then also um, the historical unfolding of our national identity as it's represented visually. And I'll talk a little bit about that, how we read documents um, visually. Notable items include some of the earliest visual documentation of European and American Indian interactions. For instance, the 17th century watercolor sketches of French explorer Benjamin de Mont de Montigny, who pictorially recorded the daily lives, ceremonies, and material culture of the Pascagoula, Natchez, and Biloxi people of what is now Mississippi and Louisiana, including the studies of the bodies and adornment of Natchez women chiefs, their ceremonies, and their daily lives. Some of our most aesthetically rich items include the arduous Elbridge Burbank, um, Elbridge Air Burbank's oil paintings and drawings of Western and Southwestern Indians, which consist of 19th century portraits of prominent leaders and other community members from 125 Indian nations across the US. Burbank studied in Chicago and Germany and painted 1,200 portraits. The Newbury holds 25. Burbank's most beautiful images include two portraits of um, two women, Honey Mehta and Pa Lee, the artist's careful attention to each woman's distinct facial features, and the careful adornment of body paint, the bu butterfly or squash blossom swirl hairstyle of, unmarried, of an unmarried Hopi woman, turquoise earrings and handwoven textiles all lend to the aesthetic quality of these In 1897 and 98, Burbank created portraits of the prominent Chiricahua Apache chief, Geronimo. And also the Potawatomi leader, Simon Pekagan. Burbank is the only known artist to paint Geronimo from life. And Simon Pekagan is also, as many of you know, a well-known scholar and activist um, who visited Washington, D.C. several times three times during Presidents Lincoln and Grant's administrations. And I like to share the story that about President Lincoln, Pekagan wrote, I think he is the tallest man I have ever known. During both their portrait sittings, tribal leaders developed friendly connections with Burbank. They smoked cigarettes together, shared meals, and exchanged humor with the artist. Other historically potent materials within the Air Collection also include the artist Frank Blackwell Mayer's sketchbooks of the Dakota peoples during the signing of the 1851 Treaty of Traverse de Sioux, which opened over 24 million acres for the settlement in what is now southern Minnesota. Mayer's sketches, sketches further represent more intimate family connections and contain the only known portrait of Nancy or Winona Eastman, who was the daughter of the 19th century landscape artist map maker and U.S. Brigadier General Seth Eastman. Nancy Eastman was also the mother of the prominent Dakota scholar Dr. Charles Eastman. Dr. Eastman was a prolific writer and published 14 books about Indian life. He also published 32 Indian, he established 32 Indian groups at the YMCA, helped to found the Boy Scouts of America and the Campfire Girls. Samples of Eastman's personal papers are held in our um, also held in our collection. Nancy Eastman, his mother, died during childbirth in 1858. And in 1933, when Dr. Charles Eastman visited the Newberry and viewed for the first time his mother's portrait, he became extremely emotional and said, to think, I have just seen an image of my mother. Eastman would later visit the image numerous, several more times, so he came back again and again and eventually he had hired an artist to have a copy made. 
artwork specifically created by American Indian artists include 19th century Cheyenne, Arapaho, and Kiowa ledger drawings, which depict battles, courtship scenes, and political negotiations between Plains Indian peoples and the US militaries. And these, as many of you know, have their own very political, um, very potent history um, that I'm not gonna go into at this point, but um, the basic history of the ledger drawings is that they were created by prisoners, um, basically um, prisoners of war. So working with American Indian indigenous materials. Working with indigenous historical materials, and more specifically in this, in this case, two-dimensional documents that include treaties, journals, personal and legal correspondence, European as well as indigenous maps, photographs, paintings, drawings, all of this requires, um, um, I don't know, I want to say intuitive, but and it, and in many ways it is intuitive, but it's a um, very in-depth understanding um, and respect for the very personal and sometimes sacred meaning that these items hold for the indigenous communities um, from whom they originate. On a consistent basis, American Indian and other indigenous delegations visit the collections that are relevant to the communities and to their families. These visits uh, often involve consultations between our research and our library staff members. And we get together and have meetings in order to prearrange the most supportive environment for these, um, for these visits. These are very personalized visits, and it is not uncommon um, for emotions to run high with Native delegations and, and also individual Native scholars. Um, it's very common that they experience a wide range of emotions, everything from joy to excitement to um, very deep sadness and just um, anger over materials that reflect their own and their communal histories and also this devastating historical trauma that's related to how these materials were collected and also um, the institution where they are now in possession. Oh, I should go back. So this was um, a visit last summer um, when Chief Glenna Wallace and members of the Eastern Shawnee Nation came to the Newberry and wanted to um, look through documents that were related to their uh, community. They spent a week in our collections going through everything related to the Eastern Shawnee and it was quite an amazing experience for everyone, um, including our library staff because it was very emotional for them. They came across documents um, about adopted members in their community, names of people, family members that they had never seen before, Indian names, all of these things. Um, so as you can imagine, it was um, a, a powerful experience for everyone. These types of visits require a certain level of ambassadorship between the Darcy McNichol Center, which I'll talk a little bit about, and also the library staff because they are completely um, different than the typical scholar who might come in who has no personal connection to these materials. So it's an altogether different experience for our library staff. These archival visits are organized with great care and attention to detail and a level of consideration that is not always routine, um, as I mentioned, with non-Indigenous institutions. A sense of flexibility is critical since Native visitors often want to hold ceremonies or document their own personal interactions with specific items. Conservation requirements and view viewing restrictions also come into play um, during these visits. And as, as I mentioned, these um, interactions really push our staff um, to really think outside what I would call the, you know, the traditional collecting or archival box and um, think about the materials in, term, in terms of their materiality, their visuality, and then also um, their language. So one of the issues that we often come up with with, with these types of documents um, 
when we have tribal de delegations who visit us, they'll tend to want to look for their communities in their traditional name, Kudapucha, Nde, um, uh, Anishinaabe. Um, and many times they can't find anything related to their traditional names. And they'll come to my office very frustrated and they'll say, um, and it, you know, it's very, it's a very um, sensitive issue. And I'll say, well, have you tried the 19th century um, European name for your community? Or have you tried to spell it this way? Or, you know, all these different misspellings and mispronunciations and um, misnomers. And once they do that, then suddenly the archive opens up because so many of the materials are still listed under incorrect names or not listed according to the traditional tribal identifiers. Oh, so this, um, so this slide is from a recent visit from the Quiche um, group. Um, from Guatemala, who just came here a couple weeks ago on the fall, during the fall equinox. And they held a ceremony um, blessing the Popol Vuh. And um, this is now the second time that they've done this. They did it once four years ago. Um, this is a very elaborate ceremony. It's several, several hours long. Um, it involves many members of our staff, research staff, as well as our um, library staff. And um, we're all there to be part of the ceremony and to support the Kiche community with whatever their needs are. Um, conservation issues do come into play. For example, one element of the ceremony is to have fire. But um, we cannot have fire in the Newberry. It would set up all of our sprinkler systems and our documents would be destroyed. So they symbolically have the fires um, by represented by candles around the sacred documents. Um, they're allowed to touch the documents, place petals around the documents. Um, it's a very elaborate, very beautiful ceremony with singing and chanting and praying. Um, and it's just, it's such um, a moving experience and an honor to be part, part of this. As you can imagine, my, my boss, President David Spadafora, who's president of the Newberry, this working with indigenous communities has really pushed him in many ways outside his comfort zone. And yet he's embraced it um, amazingly well. And this is now the second blessing for the Popol Vuh Popol 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 that he has participated in. And when they come back, they not only bless the document, but they bless members of our staff as the, um, the keepers and the protectors of the Popol Vuh. And we have to go through a ceremony and promise to protect the document and always ensure that the Popol Vuh will be available for younger Kiche generations to come. It's, again, very special, very emotional, and you can see He's kneeling down in front of the keychain medicine man. He's doing protective prayer over him, and um, that then they're embracing. He's making that promise. So it's not these types of ceremonies are not too far from the beginning of the Darcy McNichol Center for American Indian Indigenous Studies, which began in 1971 with the blessing ceremony from the Chicago American Indian community. Um, there were numerous members from the American Indian community there, and since that time, the center has steadily worked with the local American Indian and also international indigenous communities to create a safe space and a, a place where these communities can come together with other scholars, with tribal scholars, um, and also non-indigenous um, scholars, historians, educators, and talk about the collections, work with the collections, work together to um, write what's best about American Indian people from an indigenous perspective. So the mission of the McNichol Center is to encourage the use of the Newberry collections on American Indian history, 
improve the quality of what is written about American Indians, educate teachers and the general public about American Indian culture, history, and literature, assist American Indian tribal historians in their research, and provide a meeting ground where scholars, teachers, tribal historians, and others interested in American Indian studies can discuss their work with each other. So one of the um, programs that we've gone through the McNichol Center is the American Indian Studies Seminar Series, and I know there are people in this room that, were, that have attended, and we workshop, um, we workshop drafts of chapters, essays, papers, um, and we work with people so that they, they can get a wide range of perspectives, and, and we're, we're pretty direct with people, and we say, hey, um, so for example, we had a scholar who uh, came in, a very well-known historian who's won numerous awards, and he wanted to write about Indian canoes, the history of, or he didn't say the history of canoes, but about Indian canoes, and how they had disappeared. And there was a very powerful reaction from many of the um, scholars who were in the room who were native and said, um, disappeared for who? because we've always used our canoes, and they're part of our lives, and they're still being used. So it was very interesting um, to work with someone and, and to talk about that whole disappearing concept, the disappearing of indigenous um, people and communities and, and their livelihoods. We also provide public programs, which are free to the public. And this is um, one of our ways of staying connected with the local American Indian community. Um, so typically, it's in, in November, we have um, our Distinguished Lectures series. Uh, last year, as many of you know, we had um, a lecture on um, the Sand Creek Massacre. And um, that was with Professor Ned um, Blackhawk from Yale University. And this year, we have um, Leslie Marvin Silva coming on November 5th. All of our programs are free, and part of that is because we understand that there is an incredibly high poverty rate in among Chicago, the Chicago American Indian community. So we refuse to charge um, for our programs and feel that it's very important for members of the Chicago American Indian community, specifically uh, American Indian youth, to have access um, to these opportunities, and also to meet some of the people who are their heroes um, and interact with them and not feel intimidated, feel like they're welcome um, at the Newberry. We also support um, publications and we um, assist with um, publications. So our most recent publication it was the Why You Can't Teach United States History Without American Indians through the University of North Carolina Press, which came out in the spring of this year. Um, I'm excited about this. Um, we helped finance this, or financially support this project, and it was number one on the, um, in the education series on Amazon for um, a month after it came out. So that's pretty exciting. So I'm going to shift a little bit to my own work. So my relationship with the Newberry began when I was a student, and um, I was working on my long-term research, which John mentioned focuses on three artists in New Mexico, three women. Um, Tonita Pena, who is Pueblo, Georgia O'Keeffe, and um, um, I'm forgetting the last person thing because I'm staying in a room with the people who are staring at me. <laughs> Helen Harden, who is also a public. Okay. So um, my long-term research um, began when I was still a doctoral student, and I was focusing on the ancient Tewa Pueblo Abishu, or Abiquiu, New Mexico, um, and the local Abiquiu people and their perspectives of the American Indian artist George O'Keefe. So Abiquiu is located 25, about 25 miles north west of Santa Fe. And if you look to the bottom right of the slide, you can see Santa Fe is a little bit older than the rest of the type. And if you go straight diagonal um, toward the left top corner, the very last um, city or 
right where that bug just landed. <laughs> That's barbecue. That's perfect timing. Great. So Abiquiu, New Mexico was located on the northern path of the historic Spanish Trail and was a very active military post and trading center during the Spanish, Mexican, and U.S. occupational periods. Um, in 1850, the uh, U.S. government established the Southern Ute Agency, which served the Ute and Hickory Apache people and closed by 1882. In 1945, when the population of Abiquiu was around 600, the American painter Georgia O'Keeffe moved there permanently and purchased under very questionable circumstances the home of General Jose Maria Chavez, a notorious land speculator and Indian slave trader. Um, he also worked as a government official to Spain, Mexico, and the United States. That's the house. I went ahead. So this is Chavez's house, which O'Keeffe um, completely remodeled and um, claimed as her own. Oh, is it, is it moving on its own? The slide. So between 1945 and 49, um, O'Keefe reconstructed Chavez's historical hacienda, what, what they called La Tapia. Um, it was once used as an Indian slave prison. One of the actual prison cells, or what she called the youth room, was located in the house and was originally windowless with a large wooden door that bolted from the outside. During the renovations, the artist had a window put into the cell, turned it into a dining room, and renamed the space the Indian Room. Local citizens typically distanced themselves from this haunted space and even warned the artist and her associates of its negative history. At the time of O'Keeffe's purchase, sections of the neglected adobe were crumbling and the yard was being used um, communally for garden, gardening and as livestock shelter. According to Abiquenu people, this ongoing use of the land and the structure secured the three acres as a communal property and honored the land grants of 1754 and 1894. But in, despite this legal history, O'Keefe negotiated a buy through the Catholic <coughs> Church um, and a purchase which involved a $4,000 tax-deductible gift to the local archbishop. She also just blatantly dismissed the original land grants. Um, however, she would eventually have to face the local citizens of Abiquiu, people who she um, initially offended and who served on the local land grant board because she had to negotiate for her water use, rock for her stone wall around her garden, and also the official land legal deed of her property line. These early, very awkward interactions would set the tone between O'Keefe and many of her Abiquenio neighbors for the next 50 years. Today, Abiquenos convey a sense of dignity when sharing their own American Indian and Hispanic histories. Local families will tell you that the Genizaro Ancestors lived and died in this region long before O'Keefe arrived. Abiquenu citizens identify as the descendants of the original Hanisado community or the children of the Pueblo, the Net, Apache, Ute, Pawnee, and Comanche captives and slaves who were purchased by Spanish and Mexican elites. Despite this extensive history and local protestations, American art historians and O'Keefe fans have insistently referred to Abiquiu and the Abiquiu region, as well as the Via de la Lumbre Basin, where this, which is this um, greater region of this area, as O'Keeffe country. In my work, I argue that O'Keeffe's southwest um, Ubra visually manifests intercultural tensions and is more politically charged than American art histories portray. By utilizing um, an interdisciplinary research approach that steps outside traditional art historical narratives, and includes American Indian law, New Mexican land grants, and legal transcripts, I draw correlations between O'Keeffe's paintings and natural resource struggles to underscore the politics behind modern American art. In my work, I also demonstrate how 20th century American aesthetics, specifically in the Southwest, elided American Indian and Hispano perspectives and their contributions to modern American art. I view O'Keeffe's paintings as visual tools that convey ideas of ownership, which play out every day in art and other images, on tourist paraphernalia, travel guides, coffee table books, t-shirts, and postcards. This postcard 
I, I think maybe you can read it, um, which is circulated in local tourist shops in northern New Mexico, disseminates one of O'Keeffe's most famous and I believe most problematic quotes about a mountain, uh, a sacred mountain, Chiping or Cerro Pedernal, um, which is a sacred landmark for northern New Mexico's indigenous communities. Cerro Pedernal, um, so in 1977 to a reporter, O'Keefe made one of her most celebrated remarks. She said, it's my private mountain. God told me if I painted it often enough, I can have it. The repeated dissemination and celebration of O'Keefe's statement in interviews, magazine articles, and on postcards alongside the wide distribution of O'Keeffe's empty landscape paintings helped to perpetuate Georgia O'Keeffe, the myth, the myth of the isolated American art icon. Likewise, 20th century magazine articles focused on O'Keeffe's life and work, featuring striking images of the artist dressed dramatically, bone collecting, or wandering about an empty desert. This visual marriage of O'Keeffe, her figureless desert scapes, paintings, along with its these skillfully composed black and white portraits underscored a careful narration of the artist alone in northern New Mexico. Alluringly haunting photographs of the artist strolling or almost floating about Piedra Lumber Basin emphasize O'Keeffe's physical and spiritual connection um, to the desert lands, and just as importantly, emphasize the vacancy of Abiquiu. Articles further perpetuated this vacancy with romantic descriptions of northern New Mexico as vast, empty, and untouchable, and drew upon long-standing manifest destiny rhetoric. O'Keefe herself spoke about Abiquiu in terms that furthered her quasi-colonialist attitude. In interviews, the artist played up the desert's wonderful emptiness, which she claimed to have discovered in 1912 while teaching in Amarillo, Texas. Another quote puts a finer point on O'Keeffe's attitude. In Perry Miller Adato's 1977 film documentary, Portrait of an Artist, George O'Keeffe, the artist recalled her initial encounter with northern New Mexican landscape. On camera, in a sweet, lilting voice, she said, when I got to New Mexico, that was mine. In this image, the 9,868-foot flat-top mountain, Cerro Pedernal, which has always been a vital presence and historical landmark to northern New Mexico's indigenous communities, um, it, is, it has always been. Chiping's history dates back to centuries before the time of Christ, where artifacts found on the slopes of Pedernal itself have been dated to 7,000 BC. Between 1936 and 1958, O'Keeffe's O'Keefe's symbolic claims to Chiping were documented in over 29 different paintings of the mountain. Her images depicted the flint-covered blue mountain during all seasons from numerous perspectives under varying shades of light. So prevailing were the artist's verbal and visual claims to this landmark that between 1979 and 1984, the National Park and U.S. Forest Services considered the possibility of commemorating the artist by renaming Chiping O'Keefe Mountain. Funded by an Appropriations Act, the U.S. Department of Interior's National Park Service prepared a report entitled Georgia O'Keeffe, Home and Studio, New Mexico. Printed in May of 1979, this initial report explored new areas with potential for inclusion in the national park system. The 44-page document included maps, abiquiu history, poetic quotes about the artist and her life and art, photographs of O'Keeffe and La Tapia, and geographic studies of the Rio Chama Valley. It also included environmental descriptions, financial projections, census listings, and information regarding local natural resources. The report proposed six alternatives per for preserving, developing, interpreting, managing La Tapia and O'Keeffe's three-acre property, and also renaming the mountain. Local responses to renaming Cerro Pedernal were powerful. Abiquiu citizens protested by circulating a petition. Some wrote letters speaking out against this proposal. In March of 1988, an article entitled O'Keefe Peak, We Hope Not, appeared in the History Society of New Mexico's La Clonica de Nuevo Mexico and challenged the need of mostly non-locals to immortalize the artist by renaming a natural landmark when O'Keefe was already recognized through her artwork. More local community members banded together 
um, to form Los Vecinos de Cerro Paterna, the neighbors of Pavera Mountain. Statements from Los Vecinos affirm their historical and spiritual connection to the mountain and also critiqued O'Keefe and her fans. They wrote, Long, long time ago, a cellar by the Nile provided the resources for us to survive. It gave us flint so that we could have tools. It also provided us with land, water and land, so that we could farm. The canyon lands that surround its base offered us protection, but more importantly, it gave us a sanctuary, a place of refuge so that we could seek our own God. Without a doubt, local voices asserted a powerful connection to the mountain and land as both historical and spiritual, and expressed deep familial and cultural roots to the land that did not coincide to the land that did not coincide with O'Keefe's aesthetic appreciation of the mountain and landscape. For nearly 20 years, the O'Keefe Commemoration Project followed various legal and political twists, a legal course that involved several public laws. In my work, I do not valorize or demonize O'Keefe, but I try to understand how the standard American art historical treatments of her work, her New Mexican paintings, dismiss critical information embodied within her images, a point which becomes evident through O'Keeffe, evident once O'Keeffe's landscape paintings are recontextualized according to American Indian and Hispano perspectives and their resistance to these colonization projects. American Indian and Hispano experiences and perspectives are directly relevant to O'Keeffe's Southwest images. Her work, as um, well as the American public hype that surrounds the artist and her art, aesthetically naturalized attitudes of entitlement and acts of land appropriation, recontextualizing um, O'Keeffe's O'Keeffe, O'Keeffe's skull and landscape paintings, for example, according to Abby Kenya memory and concepts of place, clarifies. How Keith Southwest Uru developed alongside ongoing projects of U.S. colonization throughout the 20th century. I can stop there, or I can go on. Go on. I just have um, one more page. So my professional training as a visual artist and then also as an American Indian scholar um, has alerted me to specific contrivances and omissions within the O'Keefe narrative. As an artist and as a woman, I have pondered the physical possibility for one woman to create the copious body of work that O'Keefe did during her time in New Mexico, while also managing the extensive correspondence and business relations that she did. Two homes in both the New Mexico 15 miles apart, two acres of organic gardens, art exhibits, and world travel. As an American Indian scholar, I'm drawn to the experiences of the Abitanian people, and I want to know what their what are their perspectives of the artists and her and her long-term presence um, in their ancient pueblo, and also just why were there so many bones and skulls in the desert? In New Mexico, the artist's reputation for hoarding skulls and bones became well known among locals, and in interviews O'Keefe herself delightfully quipped about how eccentric she came across to others. In one magazine, the artist reminisced about local attitudes toward her hauling of animal carcasses. She stated, people were pretty annoyed having their cars filled up with these bones. But I took a barrel of bones to New York. They were my symbols of the desert, but nothing more. No, no doubt, the artist's bone affection was noted. For locals, O'Keefe's taste for dead animals must have seemed perplexing. It might have also been viewed as insensitive to Abiquenyo histories. In the early 1930s, motivated by soil erosion and the spread of during parasites, the Forest Service shot hundreds of livestock animals that were part of Abiquenyo's economy, daily life, and community. In my interview with a local community member, Floyd Trujillo, he recalled watching the approaching government vehicles that headed to the popular grazing sites and watering holes. Some local citizens followed the cars in an attempt to stop these executions. According to New Mexican historian Leslie Pauling Kempis, more than, more than 200 wild horses were shot in one day in the spring of 1934. According to another local elder, bones lay everywhere. The countryside smelled of dead animals. For years, every watering hole was littered with the skeletons and bodies of horses. Although O'Keefe did not view the bones in terms of death, Local people did. 
1936, two years following the Taylor Grazing Act and the executions in Abiquiu, O'Keefe painted horses or mules skull with turkey feathers. The image depicted an equine cranium with an obvious bullet hole in the central forehead. This particular animal, O'Keefe would portray in several paintings. The skull paintings may have accentuated O'Keefe's concept of beauty and aesthetics. However, they were also poignant visual reminders of the violence and loss experienced by Abiquenu people um, in northern New Mexico. The ongoing popularity of O'Keeffe demands that her paintings be reviewed in the light of some of the devastating historical facts that made them possible, such as forced livestock executions, land grant violations, and land appropriation. These are the details that popular and scholarly examinations of her life and work consistently leave out. These reflect large and a larger ongoing issue, the omission of American Indian and Hispano contributions to our national creative identity, our national identity, and contributions and their contributions to modern American art. This visual and verbal erasure of American Indian and Hispano experiences, first in O'Keeffe's paintings and then in the public perception of them has been key to the creation and perpetuation of Georgia, the Georgia O'Keeffe myth, that of the isolated American art icon alone in the desert. O'Keeffe her herself participated in perpetuating this nationalist myth, both intentionally and unintentionally, despite what became a close but very complex relationship with her Abiquenu neighbors. Some worked for the artist, they helped her prep her canvases, cleaned her home, gardened for her, and some became her friends. In 1968, at the age of 81, O'Keeffe expressed her own respect for Abiquenu life ways. In an interview for Life magazine, after living in the Pueblo for nearly 20 years, she stated, I'm a newcomer to Abiquiu. That's one of the lower forms of life. This reflective remark, along with her rejection of, she, so she eventually um, rejects, it takes some time, but she rejects um, the renaming of Seto Bethernal. Um, this reflective remark, along with her rejection of the proposal to rename Seto Bethernal, validates the artist's ultimate understanding of herself as a long-term visitor or guest in the Henidado Pueblo. About O'Keeffe, Abukenyo accounts are not romantic. Instead, they bear witness to the ups and downs of the artist's long-term presence in the Pueblo. They recognize the artist as human and treat her as such. After sharing with me the story of O'Keeffe's attendance to her 1964 wedding, Abiquenio resident Alice Garcia affirmed, O'Keeffe, she was just like everybody else. It is my strong belief that, without the, that throughout the second half of her career, Jojo O'Keeffe would not have reached the degree of success that she did professionally without the support and enduring patience of the local indigenous um, and advocate.